Well, hello there, and welcome back to From the Pastor's Bookshelf, a podcast uh, all about books, but really all about shaping our worldview and shaping our imagination uh, using some good books. And so we've been in something of a mini-series in the midst of this podcast, yeah. uh, talking about Christian engagement in politics. So what does it look like? What What is uh, the church's role in politics? What is our role as individual Christians in politics? How can we think about politics in a way that is careful, a way that is thoughtful, um, and a way that is Christ-like. And so the, the world is trying to shape us along certain political lines. And so we are trying to unearth some ways that we can think about this in a way that is biblical and transcends uh, just the 24-hour news cycle. And so for the uh, book that we're turning to to help us figure that out this time is a book called Political Visions and Illusions by David Coises. And this is a pretty intense book. Uh, Pastor Jeremy, why don't you tell us about it? Sure. Uh, yeah, Coises is a political science professor Professor, Christian political science uh, professor, and he actually wrote this book in 2003, uh, but then he brought out a second edition just recently in 2019, just bringing in some of the uh, things that were um, playing out in our modern context and wanted to update the book. And so it's a really good read. I would encourage anyone who wants to gain a better understanding of uh, the atmosphere we live in in our society. What's happening? What are the various forces at play that are causing us to uh, experience things as we are. And uh, so he does a good job with that. But the, his main idea, the reason he calls it political visions and illusions, is that uh, everybody desires to have an accurate vision of the world, a view of the world that is accurate. So your understanding of what's up, what's down, what's right, how do I understand um, what, what, where the future ought to be going? How do I understand where I fit in the midst of all of that? What's right, what's wrong, and such. And, uh, but, but the problem is, is even though every individual on the planet desires to have that view be an accurate one, we inherently will always, um, that, that view will always be influenced by one or more worldviews. And what the result is, is our vision of the world is actually an illusion. Hmm. An illusion is a trick, right? It's not... Um, you know, if someone does a, a magic trick, they're doing an illusion, <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> yes, what, what, what it looks like is happening is not really what's there, right? right? Uh, and so in the same way, he says, uh, our views can be these illusions, and they can be false. And these illusions are often fleshed out uh, in what we would call secular ideologies. And so he looks at five different um, classic Western uh, ideologies that exist in the Western world. He looks at uh, liberalism, conservatism, democratism, nationalism, and socialism. Hmm. Good. Um, awesome. Well, well, let's uh, dive in a little bit. I want to yeah. I want to tease out this idea of um, what an ideology is. Yeah. And so, when when Coises is talking about that, is he uh, speaking primarily in negative terms in relationship to that, or what? What exactly is the danger in an ideology? Because obviously, everybody has ideas, and some of those yeah. ideas are good. And so, how can this be uh, dangerous <clears throat> in terms of our our Christian walk? Yeah, the typical mentality would be there's competing ideologies in our world, some good, some bad. So let's find the good ones. Coises does not take that view. He would say most ideologies, or at least the five that he mentions here, have some things that are good about them and some inherent flaws. Uh, but the flaw is baked into the cake of the uh, every ideology, because he defines an ideology as basically being a modern-day manifestation of ancient idolatry. So an ideology is an idol. Well, how? Um, <clears throat> basically, it, it, the, an ideology, he argues, is always taking some aspect, some facet, some sphere of God's creation and elevating it above all the rest hmm. or pitting it against uh, some other aspect of God's creation. You know, in, in God's creation, there's a lot of diversity. Um, and um, when an ideology usually is overly reductionistic, saying, um, for, for example, with a liberalism, okay, you know, you know, what would the idea is, what would really make uh, society flourish, what would really cause us to be okay, would be if um, every individual had full autonomy. Uh, if, if, if sovereignty were to, be, were, to, were to exist within every individual so that their wants and desires, they're, they're free to live those out loud. And while that's a good thing to want to be able to have individual freedom, if you exalt that too high, 
saying that that is the chief good that and everything else must die on that altar, you're going to have some problems. And that's where it becomes idolatrous. The same thing with uh, conservatism, where you make an idol out of uh, some sort of utopian past or just holding an idol out of tradition or the status quo. Democratism, you make an idol out of, you know, whatever the majority says is right, that's right. And so there can be problems with that. Nationalism saying, no, no, as long as my nation is powerful and strong and doing well, then that's what's uh, best. But obviously there's some inherent problems with that because there's more than one nation in the world. (laughs) (laughs) And from a Christian standpoint, uh, God is not interested in one nation, he's interested in all. And then socialism, where you take the idea of the collective uh, um, is uh, uh, exalted uh, high. And so like in that example, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but um, if you say or oh, whatever is good for the group, that supersedes what, um, uh, what might be good for an individual. So if some individuals suffer or even die, then that's okay because the larger collective was, uh, was benefited from that sacrifice. And so he points out that uh, whenever you do that, um, it becomes an idol. And he even goes a bit further to say that uh, in all of these ideologies, there exists a, an alternative um, redemptive redemption narrative, hmm. meaning that there's a, a, um, a creation account of, of sorts <laughs> saying, okay, in the beginning, man was made and made free, but then governments came in and uh, took away that freedom. And redemption came from a, uh, you know, a democracy that said, no, you will have a voice. Um, and then uh, the future is individuals being free forever to do whatever they individually want to do. Or socialism, the idea that uh, you know, in the beginning, people, everything was equal in a hunter-gatherer society or something. And then <clears throat> cla- you know, the rise of the markets and whatnot, uh, of, of a free market system, now there's class disparity at a really bad uh, and, and really a strong way. And so, ah, what, if we could just fix that, then everything's okay. So it's overly reductionistic, but it has a, a re- it, there's a religious, and this is really what he argues, that every ideology has a religious element to it. Hmm. Meaning that there is a devotion to that idea, um, and uh, it and it's an idolatrous idea. There's a religious uh, flow to it, and so that that's why he uses it in a pejorative sense. Is that everybody, including the Christian, can be in danger of falling prey to uh, an ideology or an ideology's redemptive redemptive narrative, buying into that, living that out, even though they espouse Christian belief yeah. at the same time. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the ways that that can be um, really dangerous is that any time that you elevate something to um, sort of religious levels or dogmatic levels, it really affects how you view um, the world around you in yeah. terms of the, the specifically the people that you interact with. Because anybody that is then in agreement with that ideology, they're seen as part of your church, so to speak, right? Yeah. They're part of the body of Christ of that ideology, liberalism, socialism, conservatism, whatever. Yeah. Um, but then anybody who's outside of that ideology, they're they're anathema, right? Yeah. And so anybody who is coming against that, it's not just somebody coming with counter ideas. It's jihad. It's yeah. holy war against your religion. Yeah. And so if you're holding those things too highly, and so we can end up um, demonizing even other believers who are part of the actual body of Christ yeah. um, for having some different ideas, even if those are you know mis- misplaced ideas mm-hmm. or wrong ideas, um, as opposed to viewing them as brothers and sisters in Christ, Absolutely. seeing our commonality there, and then having good discussions about these ideologies and these different things um, in the midst of that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. Good. So let's uh, let's jump into um, what these ideologies are, and we have time to only tease out a couple of these. Yeah. Right? We're going to look at a few of them, and so let, let's start with liberalism. Um, how does that fit into? Obviously, that's a huge aspect of our society, and so yeah. how does that story fit into where we're at today? Yeah, and the reason why uh, I think it's good to talk about this particular one is it's and why it's even good to talk about this at all is um, for the Christian living in the world and the society we live in. How do we understand the the pool that we're swimming in. How do we understand these waters? Um, and liberalism is the uh, story of uh, America, really. And so, mm-hmm. uh, what he teases out is that um, there's a 
a uh, life cycle that liberalism is going through, and we're right in the middle of that. And so understanding that helps us, you know, again, understand where we are. But one of the things about uh, liberalism is that, as I already mentioned before, it's about uh, um, the redemptive narrative of liberalism is saying that uh, we need to the, it involves the progressive emancipation of the individual and the achievement thereby of individual freedom. That's chief. That's what is above all. But there's some problems in that because if you really think it through, uh, there's a, you run up against some, some issues. Um, for example, one of the things that we see really playing out in our modern day context is that uh, there's an alternative narrative within the liberal narrative that says, uh, underscores the endless struggle to acquire more and more freedoms, Koisa says, mm. from all sorts of limits, whether political, social, economic, or natural. And embedded in this view is the idea that emancipation is never done. Mm. It's a continual process of individuals becoming their own masters, yeah. uh, continually seeking liberation, uh, from various restraints, restraint after restraint after restraint, and those restraints are all lumped together in undifferentiated fashion under the broad rubric of oppression. So right out of the gate, uh, it doesn't usually start there, but the idea of, okay, your choices, your desires as an individual, that's what matters most, and you being free to live out those desires is what will cause not just you but all of society to experience bliss. Um, but the problem is, Think about it. What, 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 what as an individual um, who has a variety of desires or, you know, millions of individuals having a variety of desires, um, there's going to be all kinds of everything's a potential oppressor. Hmm. Anything that gets in the way of what I want to do is oppressive. And so you're mm -hmm. set up to have an issue. But anyway, the story of liberalism is basically broken up into six stages that can be put into two different categories. Okay. The first three stages uh, exist within the category of uh, the seeing the government as being uh, having a role to protect us from um, a ne or, or protect our negative rights. Now, a negative right is when mm -hmm. something from the outside is coming in to hurt you, and so government's role in that those first three these first three stages has to do or government's role in gen in, in in general in the liberal mindset is <clears throat> if something I'm going to protect you from outside forces coming and hurting you in some way. So in the first stage, it's just um, in the Hobbesian commonwealth, they call it, is that the uh, government exists or the sovereign exists to protect other individuals from harming you physically. But then that, trans mm -hmm. that, that moves, so you start there, then you move into another stage, which they call the night watchman state, where government exists not just to protect you from bodily harm, but also from uh, if one were to have private property or uh, the ability to accumulate wealth is that government should exist to protect your ability to make a living for yourself. Okay, So that's yeah. where you see in the story of liberalism, that's where you see the rise, uh, you, see, you know, Smith and Locke, you know, the rise of the free market taking right. place. The idea that, hey, we, we, again, government should exist to protect the free market from flourishing and taking off. And so the early part of American history is within that stage. Okay. Mm. And then that translates into, uh, or moves rather, into the third stage, which is the regulatory stage. And this is, you look at the 1800s, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, and a variety of things that happen with that, is that you see centers of power, uh, uh, economic forces of power, um, non-government entities come up and they have a tremendous influence in society. So in the first two stages, the idea is, okay, government should protect you, but government is also seen as possibly the greatest threat to our liberty because they have the power to do it, okay? So they're saying there should be limits on government, just protect me from bodily harm and protect my private property. Everything else, just stay out of my business. That's the idea mm -hmm. of the early stages of liberalism. But when they recognize, wait a second, there's um, you know robber barons and there's uh, the economic situation is such that uh, you know the disparity within you know the workers are having a really rough go of it. But these uh, rich bigwigs are just taking advantage of the liberty that they have to do what they want to do. And so the regulatory state came in and said, let's make some laws to protect that. And so the third stage says, you know, the state exists not just to protect you from bodily harm or protect your private property, but protect you from other economic forces or, or uh, and non-state-centered sources, uh, centers of power. And so yeah. 
And I think, so that's all within the idea of saying we want to, the government should exist to protect you, protect your negative rights. Mm -hmm. There's oppressive economic forces, not enough forces, economic entities, personal actors, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, um, you know, Carnegie and the steel mills in Pennsylvania uh, saying, whoa, the situation you're creating for your workers, they're trapped in this. This is a bad situation. Let's adjust that. Or, again, like I already mentioned. But then there's a huge shift that takes place in liberalism, and that's where in the latter stages, the last three, the government moves from just not protecting negative rights but enforcing positive rights. Now, a positive right has to do – it's a little bit uh, different. A positive right obligates people to act on behalf of another. Mm -hmm. So um, this is where you see the rise of the welfare state. So what one of the one of the flaws now again if we live in the middle of liberalism one of the things that we will always think and believe is it'll be obvious to us that of course the rights of the individual are paramount and we think that we we have a tendency to want to elevate that but it does not treat um, one of the failures of liberalism is that it treats everyone as individual runners right. saying if you just take personal responsibility and try hard, everyone has an equal shake. But what they found out is, obviously that's not true, not everybody has the same starting point. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> and not everyone, uh, you know, based on com- uh, you know, communal factors, what, what subculture you live in within yeah. uh, 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 the state or, or within your culture, um, also uh, generationally, you know, what the people who are in your family line, what they did before you, you know, causes you to start at a much different place than some other person. Right? right, and so, if you're banking on liberalism being your salvation, then what happens at this stage is you recognize, ah, there's a failure here. It, it's not enough to cause society to fully flourish. And the mistake of liberalism at that point is to turn to, well, let's fix it, rather right. than saying, okay, this is a flawed ideology. We maybe we should come up with some other ideas or. Uh, have a completely different way of looking at it. They say, no, 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 no. We just need more government mm-hmm. to get everyone on an equal playing field, and that's the rise of the welfare state. Then you see beyond that is the rise of the what's called the choice enhancement state. And so, uh, in the in the third stage or the fourth stage rather, the rise of the welfare state, government is not just protecting people from personal actors causing harm, but impersonal forces like poverty and all kinds of things, and that's problematic. And, uh, but then the fifth stage is the choice enhancement state where um, you, 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 they begin to recognize, wait a second, all these oppressors are out there, all these individuals are out there. If, if, if all that, what really matters is me, if there's no real objective good, then sovereignty lies in the will of the individual. Right. And so if the will of the individual is what must be liberated, now you have in a country like ours 320 some million people with individual wills all fighting to be free of anyone who would oppress them from doing what they want to do. And that creates a <laughs> whole lot of conflict. Yeah. And that creates a lot of problems. And so uh, one of the dilemmas is uh, in that particular stage is that when you're um, – is that you're not having an objective – idea of morality. You're saying morality is whatever you want it to be. And there's consequences to that. If I remove objective morality from society, then there's moral consequences. So for example, you might say, um, and one of the examples he uses in his book is that if someone wants to get a divorce, it used to be very hard to get a divorce. Mm -hmm. But then the liberal, as the liberal track kept train kept on going, they say, wait a second, they should be able to do what they want. If they don't want to be in that marriage, let them out. That's good to let that person be free to do that. And there might be some truth in that, depending on the situation. But the what the consequence of making now divorce not hard but super easy is now that you have broken homes, you have kids growing up in poverty, you have kids growing up emotionally scarred, and that, or let's say uh, the other thing, people should be free to take any drug they want to take. Yeah. You know, let's let that personal choice trump anything else, and so they should be able to do that. Um, now you have consequences in society because of heightened drug use, and so what liberalism fails at this point is that then they say, okay, wh- what do we do? There's consequences. Let's get more government. Yeah. More government. And so the the state exists not just to protect us from our negative protect our negative rights. Now the state exists to solve all our problems. And that's where we see ourselves today.
Yeah, that's a it's a tough spot to be in because so much of what our country is founded on is obviously the concept of freedom, right? Yeah. And individual freedom is a very good thing. The Enlightenment sort of saved that, for, yeah. sort of you know saved mm. the individual in a sense from uh, you know medieval serfdom or something like that, where things are really really yeah. bad. And so there's a lot of good. Um, here's a quote from uh, Tim Keller that that I looked up as you were talking. Um, he says this in his book Making Sense of God, mm. and um, it's in a chapter on freedom and. It's says, why can't I be free to live as I see fit as long as I don't harm anyone? And he says this, today as a culture, we believe freedom is the highest good, that becoming free is the only heroic story we have left. Yeah. And you see that in all sorts of movies, right? Hollywood mm-hmm. is filled with stories of people getting free, getting free from their parents, free from their you know religious orthodox backgrounds, getting free to live as they see fit. Um, so the only heroic story we have left and that giving individuals freedom is the main role of any institution and of society itself. It is, we could say the baseline cultural narrative of our Western culture. It has always been important, but now it is ultimately important. It is the one truth that relativizes all other doctrines and beliefs. And so if we raise that up, that becomes problematic in all sorts of levels, all right? You see the breakdown of, of the family, uh, rise in, in divorces, right? And yeah. you see now, of course, freedom of choice has, has it's it's uh, it's worse than it's ever been in the yeah. sense that we're telling people they can choose their own gender. Mm-hmm. Um, all sorts of choices that yeah. the Bible says are actually harmful to them, but in the name of freedom, who's going to stand in their way of freedom? Other, yeah. Otherwise, they're just seen as an oppressor. Yeah, and, and that's so, what allowed the abortion uh, yeah. uh, right uh, to be a thing. It's oh, like, no, absolutely. no, I should be free to choose what I want to do. Yeah. Even if it's killing, right, right. Life. In that yeah. sense, and that's the that's the uh, the paradox of freedom. Yeah. Is I want to be free to do this. Well, what about that other person's mm-hmm. freedom? In this case, what about the freedom of the individual in the womb? That's an individual yeah. that should have the same freedom and same unalienable rights. Yeah. Um, but it becomes it becomes a mess. Yeah. And, and so, and uh, one of the things that he uh, brings out in the book too is that he said the first five stages we can observe and see in historically taking place. He postulates that there's a sixth stage coming. Hmm. And uh, it's it's just right aligned with what you were saying, is that the failure of liberalism is that if every individual is free to do whatever they want to do, you're going to begin harming other individuals, hampering and hindering other individuals' freedom. Yeah. So when the state at first was just saying, I'm going to have a limited role of keeping you free from some of the hard stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I, we've created a society where you can, we want to, government is going to protect you to do whatever you want. They can't do that. That's not tenable. Yeah. It's impossible. And so the sixth stage is a situation where there's going to be more and more and more conflict taking place uh, within society. It sounds happy. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think you see that happening now. Oh, absolutely. Why, why, there's yeah. a lot of reasons why there's increased polarization uh, in our nation, but I think this is a big part of it. It's yeah. the liberal, uh, the liberal story. Yeah. Um, uh, the story, the ideology of liberalism, that started out with most everyone living in America would agree is good, but right. ended up here, and it's inevitable. That's his whole thing. Is this is a tide or a the current rather a river moving in a certain direction. Yeah. And because this ideology is idolatrous and therefore flawed yeah. and not looking at it as overly reductionistic, you can't help but have this outcome. Yeah. And that, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I've been uh, reading this book called Why the Nations Rage by Jonathan Lehman, yeah. and he draws that point out as well. He says, um, a lot of the founding fathers, he says, if, if we are espousing freedom apart from God, it can't not lead to these places. And so yeah. he said guys like Locke and Jefferson, uh, some of the framers of the Constitution, um, they are they, they saw this enlightenment idea of the sovereignty of the individual and individual freedom, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. If that is held as the highest good, um, Lehman goes on to say, it's no wonder. He's the the inevitable place that that leads to is places like the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. He says, if we're elevating the freedom of the individual, of course that's going to go where the sexual revolution is going. Of course, of course that's going to lead there. And so he goes on to say the only, obviously the only true freedom that we can have is freedom in Christ. And that's what Tim Keller, that's his point in this, in this book is uh, freedom in Christ is the only freedom that doesn't end up actually restricting us in the long run or taking away freedom from others, because that's Mm -hmm. completely untenable. No, you yeah, it will not work. Yeah. And so that's where we need to reject that ideology, recognize the the good aspects of it, that we should um, 
protect the rights of the individual, but there are limits to that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if it's being held up to the highest good, it's always going to go there. And the, the irony, the great irony of liberalism is that it starts by saying, seeing government as the greatest threat to our liberty, and so let's put limits on government mm -hmm. so that we can be free to do what we want to do. But when the idea plays out, government becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and to where finally, when that, that in the sixth stage, he says that um, when that conflict grows and grows and grows, eventually the state has to step in and just say enough, and the state becomes tyrannical at that point. Yeah, and so they they take people's freedom away in the name of freedom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So liberties are removed in the name of liberty. Yeah, <laughs> and that's where we're headed. Awesome. That, Sounds that, encouraging. Well, <laughs> <laughs> now what, one thing he does mention in the book as well is. Um, uh, that I think is was encouraging to me is that in the midst of all these ideologies, the ones the, the one we've talked about and the others that we will talk about, it all the, the 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 ideology as an individual ideology playing out always ends badly. Right. But um, God's God is present in this world, hmm. and His common grace exists as such that He'll never let things get too out of hand. And so that's important to remember when we think through these things. But um, I think it would be a good point to, uh, to move on to conservatism yeah. uh, to see how it fits within this liberal story. Yeah, yeah. Because conservatism is an ideology you hear talked about. I mean, um, but usually conservatism is pitted against liberalism, mm -hmm. right, in our political uh, moment. Uh, that's And for years it's been that. You've got the conservatives and you've got the liberals. Uh, but conservatism does not exist independently uh, of itself as an ideology. Hmm. Um, conservatism, well, first question you have to ask is, what are you conserving? Right. Well, that depends on what time you live in and what place you live, mm -hmm. right? So, um, for, for example, uh, so that could be good or bad. If you're in uh, the antebellum South, you're trying to conserve slavery, you might call yourself conservative, but that's a misguided conservatism. Um, and so in the American context... Um, a conser well, well, let me back up. A conservative, conservative mentality is one that says values tradition, uh, recognizes the importance of keeping the status quo. Um, you know, th there's a recognition within most people who have a conservative mentality that um, th that people are fallen; they're not inherently good, and therefore any civilization that exists or any society that exists is very fragile, because um, if you um, uh, if you, you bring in new ideas or blow up the current system, that um, is because within like socialism, which we'll get to, <laughs> or uh, you know la later stages of liberalism, which is saying, hey, let's change everything. It, it's if someone comes in and says, <clears throat> we need to. If if you, if you don't believe that the ultimate problem with humanity is sinful hearts, yeah. if instead you see the ultimate evil as being corrupt systems. Mm -hmm. So society is bad because systems are corrupt versus the conservative would say, no, 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 society is bad because people are corrupt. And it's right. biblically true. Right. And so <clears throat> a conservative then says, okay, you could blow up this system and create a new one, but it's going to be either just as bad or far worse. <laughs> and so they're going to be very skeptical of change mm -hmm. because they recognize that the, a, a change of structure is not necessarily what's needed. What's needed is a change of heart. And, uh, and, and, and so whether you're a, if you're a Christian conservative, you have hope that Christ will transform hearts and stuff. If you're yeah. a secular conservative, you're just going to say, no, 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 people always are bad. And so let's just keep it with God and hope that it's all right. You know? um, and so, that, but so where does that fit within um, the American context is that um, a conservative, uh, and again, a conservative can be different wherever, depending on where you live. You lived in 1770 Great Britain. A conservative was saying, no, let's keep the monarchy. Mm -hmm. I want to conserve that. But in America, what are we conserving? Well, if I mentioned that in the story of liberalism, you have uh, these six stages. So you have three where, uh, the first three where government exists to protect our negative rights. And then it shifts in stage four, the rise of the welfare state, uh, where you're enforcing positive rights. And then certainly the choice enhancement state. Most modern day conservatives would say, that, that's where they draw a line. They're wanting to conserve yeah. a society that is based on the in the somewhere in the first three. 
And, that, and that's really where American conservatism, as we know it today, sort mm-hmm. of was birthed, yes, right? Exactly. You didn't have conservatives the way that we know them in <clears throat> you know, the late 1800s or something like that. No, yeah, the rise of the welfare state happened in the 30s under FDR mm-hmm. um, in response to the Great Depression and all that. And so uh, it was right after that that you saw that, uh, that movement rise up going, whoa, 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 we just shifted gears here. Yeah. Well, wh- where are we going? We, don't, we want to conserve that. So... Um, in America, that's what they're, they're, they're either doing one of two things, wanting to uh, say, let's go back to those earlier stages of liberalism, or they're just trying to slow the tide down, you know, slow the current. And what Coises postulates is that because uh, we live in a society built on liberalism, we're all liberals, <laughs> despite the, sure. uh, the, the current uh, nomenclature, you know, uh, we're all, cons- we're all uh, liberals, but conservative liberals are just trying to slow the, the ine- what Coises would describe as the inevitable tide of liberalism. And someone who would identify as a liberal today is one to say, no, 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 let's keep going. This is right. good. We're heading in this direction. You right. know? Um, uh, and then that's where it's some of the, um, you know, so how is conservatism idolatrous? It's um, elevating uh, traditions, and the status quo uh, above uh, everything else, saying that the most important thing we need to do is just hold on to tradition, keep the status quo. We're, we're against change. We're uncomfortable from change, with change. And that can be good or bad, depending on your, again, on your context. So someone who is a conservative, who, who's a, a, um, theologically conservative, well, that's yeah. good because you're saying, no, 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 let's stick to the Bible. Right. Let's let, let's conserve the truth of the Bible as opposed to changing it, augmenting it in some way. So that's a, a situation where conservative would be uh, conservatism would be quite good. Um, but if you have a conservative mentality and you are wholesale saying no, 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 tradition is good, there's going to be a mix. Uh, and the reality, uh, the, if the conservative creed is we need to hold the status quo, there's two errors. One is you're either um, trying to conserve something that's a mix of good and folly, you know, good and bad, or you become overly romantic uh, about some golden age in the past mm-hmm. that never really existed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, as we, we were talking earlier, you mentioned, Ryan, that uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, conservatives are suspect of any utopian ideals, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the, and so other, you know, liberalism, socialism, um, they always have this idea of a utopia that if we just bring about a revolution and change things up, then everything's going to be amazing and good and better. Um, where conservatives are suspect of that and say, no, 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 we're not for utopia. But as you pointed out, I thought it was really good is that, no, 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 you have a utopia. It's just somewhere in the past. Right. Right. It's so a, uto- <laughs> you're looking to a utopia in yonder year. And if we just get back to that, everything will be be okay. But the problem is nostalgia is deceiving. Nostalgia right. says there's a golden age where everything was right and good. But if you actually go back to that place, uh, it was a mix of good and bad. Right. And so that's where the conservative can err. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think as that, an ideology. Um, for sure. I think that, and again, one of the problems with ideologies is because um, each ideology has a redemptive story baked into it, a yeah. story of sin and salvation, <clears throat> there's always some view of heaven as well, right? Yeah. And so that view of heaven for a liberal or for a socialist might be at some point in the future, and so we are either going to uh, cause revolution or we're going to continue to uh, you know, lift up the freedom of the individual in order to try to get to that utopian state, whereas for the conservative, they can their, their view of heaven can be in the past, like you said. Yeah. And so we need to get back <clears throat> to that, not realizing that, well, maybe it wasn't quite so heavenly if you actually lived there, or maybe for some people it was really good, but for others, it was actually really bad. Yeah. And so I think oftentimes um, conservatives can resist progress in places where progress actually needs to be made. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, and you can you can see that today in a variety of uh, different areas. You yeah. know, and at the same time, understanding that there are some things that should be conserved, you know, biblically, mm-hmm. that, that should be conserved. Or and even so, just sociologically, whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, that, and that's where over, being overly reductionistic is the fatal flaw. Of both right. those ideologies, it, right. so that the if if the liberal ideology is saying, or the socialist ideology, which we haven't really unpacked yet, but we'll, we'll get to, is saying, no, 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 the, there's something wrong with society. We need to blow up everything and build everything anew from the ground up. You're getting rid of a lot of good, 
Yeah. And you might be trying to put in place some some um, uh, some good. So you're um, but 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 if you're overly reductionistic, you're causing a lot of problems, yeah. right? And so for the liberal who says that. For people who are looking at things that are, are good right now, they're saying, wait a second, well, I don't want to lose that. Why would you even say that, right? right. Um, but for the, con for the conservative, the, we can be um, uh, tone deaf uh, in if we say, no, 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 we need to get back to how it was in yesteryear. Well, if there's other individuals going, wait a second, it wasn't so good for me and my people at that point, you know? Sure. And so um, if it w likewise, we can't say it was all good back then yeah. And uh, so we need to be cautious in the way we have those conversations Rec and, and being not ideological, but biblical, recognizing yeah. that man is sinful and God is faithful to do continually bring about good and bring about change um, in a way that's positive, but also it can, that can be sinful and so we need to watch out for that. So really we need both the conservative-minded individual and the liberal-minded uh, individual working together uh, humbly so that... Um, you know, better policy is made. So you're getting rid of the bad, keeping the good, and and moving forward in a way that's uh, hopefully sure. causing, leading to some level of human flourishing. But within the ideological um, way of looking at it, it's the you're not that's not going to happen, right, right? Right. Because it's a religious belief. If it becomes idolatrous, like Coises is is uh, um, asserting. Yeah. So let's um, let's use that opportunity to pivot a little bit. So yep. I think one thing that you see in um, in sort of late liberalism and, and socialism, which is what we'll talk about um, here in a sec, is again regarding institutions like you had mentioned, right? People seeing institutions, seeing them as inherently flawed. And if, if your if your version of humanity is that sin does not exist in the human heart, but sin yeah. exists in the structures itself, well, then the only way to fix the structure is to sort of tear it down. And so you get this this deconstructionist mind mindset of let's tear down the institution yeah. of the family, let's tear down the institution of the church, let's change the institution of public education to serve yeah. the state's needs. Um, and then that sort of pokes at some of these um, some of these uh, socialism areas. And mm -hmm. so, so talk to us about socialism, and specifically uh, what I want to know is how the heck are we talking about socialism right now in our cultural yeah. moment? <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, <clears throat> conservatives look at, uh, really anybody can look at history and see where socialism has failed left and right. Badly, yeah. And so it has a terrible historical record. And so how is it, knowing history, that we are even talking about socialism right now? Why why is it so attractive to people, and how does it fit into this bigger story? Yeah, and I would add to that question is, how can a society like ours, based on individualism, adopt socialism, which is all about the collective? Right. Yeah, at the expense of the individual. Yeah, it seems and so, so It's contrary. backwards. So how, you know, so... Uh, socialism. So, what first? What is socialism? Socialism, uh, in in its idolatrous form, if you will, is um, elevating or it sees inequality as the greatest evil of society. So, mm -hmm. one of the things that every ideology will do is elevate one aspect of God's creation or one aspect of society above the rest, and then uh, recognize evil as the source of evil being in some other aspect, um, but some other aspect other than. Um, our rebellion against God. Right. Right. So with socialism, the idea is inequality is the greatest evil. They overly reduce everything to economics yeah. and uh, say inequality is the greatest evil and that uh, socialism provides an escape. And that escape is a revolution mm -hmm. where they, they, and they see evil as being, uh, socialists would see the evil as being capitalism being inherently flawed uh, from, their, from their point of view and saying that uh, the free market allows for class disparity to exist, uh, where you have the haves and the haves and nots, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And the only way is to have a uh, all-powerful state come in and force equality, hmm. meaning that, um, and, and that's overly reductionistic because there is not, and ever, there, people are equally, um, e equally have dignity within God's creation, mm -hmm. but people are not equal uh, in the sense that people have, there's a diversity, people have varying levels of intellect, right? Yeah. Uh, people have varying levels of um, uh, just skill, ability, uh, luck, yeah. <laughs> or you know, we, I mean, Christian would say providence, but you know, yeah. some people's success is a result of uh, things that just happened outside of their 
you know, uh, you know their prowess or their ability. And so um, uh, the socialists would ignore all of that and say, no, 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 the only way that a justice, uh, the only way you could uh, describe a just society is that everyone um, ends at the same place. Yeah. But the fallacy is if you force that, you disrupt society to such a degree that um, uh, society will no longer work. Hmm. You know, incentive structures are not uh, effectively in place. You know, if you if you say, okay, you know what, you no longer have a choice in what kind of in in the full communistic sort of idea of socialism or Marxism is that you don't, as opposed to having incentive to try to create something that would be valuable to society and then that would lead to um, you know good in society in some way, and so the person's highly motivated to try to bring that to market and and do well and be proficient. If you say, no, you're going to do this job forever without um, any hope of advancement or whatever, you're going to have very little incentive to thrive, strive to do well. And so it just kind of falls in. So that's just one example. The worst uh, form of socialism is if you say, no, no, we need to make everyone equal. And so everyone being equal is the goal. Even if that means some individuals will suffer as a result of that, okay. either suffer, uh, you know, at worst, they're, they're actually killed yeah. or uh, or they're um, uh, they're, they're you know they were doing economically well and they're brought down low that you know that kind of suffering the, that they say that sacrifices made for the greater good of the whole the individual is left behind and so it's a it's a collectivist view and so that's where trying to understand why would socialism ever be popular again after it's failed in an individualistic society a society that yeah. we've already went great lengths talked about how it's all about the individual and the rights of the individual why would socialism be popular now and it has to do with this that in the in the later stages of liberalism where the rise of the state state apparatus the um the growth of the state a uh, state apparatus existing to uh, either ensure uh, individual rights from various oppressions or oppressors rather uh, or the state stepping in to quell the inherent conflict with such a system um, that lines that that larger state apparatus and that higher degree of control mm -hmm. you know and so in uh, for example in our day you see uh, some government um, uh, pundits or uh, political pundits saying no 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 we need more control the government is going to tell you what you, uh, you 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 get to do or don't get to do based on the the greater good or based on not you know I'm trying to think of an example um, uh, some sort of um, you don't get to do this because that could hurt this person and so we're going to right. control your freedom in some way but it's like you know just a, a, a safe space you, you, you I guess a good example the freedom of speech. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it used to be forever. It was, uh, you know, freedom of speech was a central part of our society. And now all of a sudden that's under threat. Why? Because they're trying to protect this individual um, from being hurt by your words. And so you need to be silenced. Yeah. It's like, whoa, whoa, a timeout. We have left the liberal sphere and moved into something else. And so from Coises' perspective, the late liberal is okay with that mm. in the same way that a socialist would be okay with that. But right. they're coming at it from different um, ideological uh, uh, foundations. So the late liberal is wanting to protect the individual in a flawed way. The socialist is wanting control because of this collectivist utopian dream. Yeah. And they find that, um, so why would it come up now? Because their agenda on the surface begins to look very similar. Right. You mean it makes sense? So they, yeah. they sort of, and in a sense, they build a coalition. And um, so someone who has a socialist mindset would be actually attractive on the surface, at least, to a late uh, stage liberal. Interesting. Yeah. Does that make, is that, uh, yeah, yeah, I think clear? so. And it's really, it's interesting to see it play out um, in culture. Oftentimes in, uh, in academia, for example, you have who you might be able to find as sort of um, classical liberal professors who are now older being kicked out for holding yeah. these, what at the time when they were up and coming, incredibly liberal progressive views that are now not nearly liberal or progressive enough because they're trying to hold to, so in, in a sense, they're conservative in the sense they're trying to hold on to a form of liberalism that 
used to be very liberal, but now no longer is. Yeah. And so they end up getting canceled or certain things for holding on to something like freedom of speech, right? Holding on to, you know, booking conservative speakers at a yeah. college or something like that. Um, I think you even see some of this conflict within the Democrat Party as well. Mm-hmm. And so you have this older generation, the Nancy Pelosi sort of generation yeah. of liberals and then sort of transitioning into late liberals. But then you also have this up and coming uh, more social Democrat Party. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's creating all sorts of strife and conflict within the Democrat Party. Mm-hmm. And so they have a coalition in the sense that a lot of the policies and views are very similar. Um, but it's creating incredible conflict as well. Yeah. And so we'll see we'll see what happens, I guess. <laughs> see how that plays out. Yeah, because in you so what what you have is um people who are socialist in their ideology, yeah. living within a, a liberal society. Um, but they're appealing to late stage uh, liberals in in saying, well, I think one thing that is common in in the, in the two. Another reason why I think you see that rise up now and them sort of join together is one of the flaws of liberalism, as we've mentioned earlier, is that there's no objective truth or good. Good or truth is found within the sovereignty of a, a, a individual's will, and that creates a spiritually vacant state. There is no mm. good or bad. It's just that um, it sort of creates an atheistic mindset, whether you even would call it that uh, or or not. <clears throat> and the problem that that creates that's similar for the socialist and the late stage liberal is that um, they would not identify the problem with the world as being sin within a human heart. Mm. The 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 problem. Whereas the conservative agrees with that. Yeah, right. that goes. Uh, whether they would call it sin or, the, or in the human heart or just that people are flawed and, and corrupt, you know, uh, at a base level. Both late-stage liberals and especially liberalism because you're saying that – th- so late-stage liberals are saying, no, 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 people are good. Right. They're so good that even whatever they want is divinely you know, great. That's ultimate good. Yeah. So you take that mentality that says – because people aren't the problem, it's structures, it's society at large, it's it's problematic structures that would come and oppress or hurt this individual, yeah. okay? And so they say the next stage of, of liberating them is to blow up the whole system, blow up the, it's not about changing the individual and where they're at, it's about blowing up the whole system so that um, we this individual can be free. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the socialist comes at it not from that standpoint, but also agrees that if we're going to transform society and cause equa- equality, then uh, social change does not come easily. You're right. Yeah. It doesn't. So you can't just piecemeal your way through this. You need to blow it all up and start from scratch. And so again, they find common ground, coming at it from different angles, uh, and for somewhat different reasons. But they both want revolution. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, and I think obviously one of the problems with that is the revolution's never over, right? Yeah. In, in, the, yeah. in the slide of liberalism, it becomes a perpetual revolution um, that's never ending. There's always a new victim. There's always a new oppressor. There's always a system that can be torn down because obviously the Bible says because sin is in the human heart, yeah. even if we tear this system down and build something else, that's going to be just as bad or even worse. Mm-hmm. And so and I, I do think that that's one of the differences between um, sort of this late stage liberalism that we have now and the liberalism of some of the founding fathers mm-hmm. who had a uh, generally a better understanding of the sinfulness of the human heart, which yeah. is why when they framed the Constitution, they created a series of checks and balances yeah. Um, in order to prevent some of that, it wasn't yeah. the it wasn't like the you know full on French Revolution idea that man man is inherently good, and therefore we need to liberate him from society. And if society wasn't corrupting him, then he would yeah. just thrive and grow and find his desires and live happily ever after. Whereas the founding fathers, many of whom are Christian, of course, they said no. Actually, man, yes, we want the freedom for the individual, but individuals are also sinful, and so we need a series of checks and balances to keep these institutions yeah. in place, right? And that's what you see today and and it's it's still working hopefully yeah. it'll continue yeah, to work for a continue, long time yeah in his uh when he talks about dem- uh, democratism yeah. as uh an ideology um you know that's the idea that whatever the 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 majority wants that's what should happen in society and um and, and that's problematic yeah and so a but that what's beautiful about the american uh, governmental setup is just what you said is that it has those checks and balances to protect mob rule from occurring yeah. But you only would agree with that if you believe that humanity is inherently sinful. 
Right. And so they need to be protections against that. And so yeah, that's good. Well, <clears throat> well, with that, um, why don't we why don't we pivot to this closing section here and talk yeah. about the the Christian response? So how do we how do we take all these ideologies? Yeah. How do we boil them down? And how the heck do we think about this as uh, Christ followers? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is to um, not to, to recognize the religious aspect of ideologies. I think that's a mm. very helpful thing that Coises teases out in his book, is that if, if you see ideologies as just being innocuous or just ideas that have some good and some bad, um, then as a Christian, you are in danger of adopting that ideology without recognizing you're really stepping into a religion, another right. religion, right? and you can be caught up in the religious fervor of that religion or that ideological religion. And so just being cautious that we should not take ideological sides or give in to the idea that, you know, this whole, because one of the religious, uh, uh, one of the, the ways that ideologies take on a religious form is they would say the world would be better if everybody was a, if, if you're a social, if you're in socialism, if everyone was a socialist, then everything would be better. If everyone was a conservative, everything would be better. Liberal. Or you could say that about the church. You know, if everyone was born again, mm -hmm. the whole planet, then yes, that is a right thing because God is God. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's the <laughs> redemption story we're holding on to as being that was what would change the world. If God redeems our heart and liberates us from sin. Yeah, as opposed to if everyone was one of these ideologies. And so just t being taking care to not be caught up in that, but also um, to not to be able to recognize that all of these ideologies are, are flawed, but they also are recognizing something about society um, that needs attention. You know, the idea of having uh, conserving traditions, that needs tradition and status quo, that needs attention. Uh, you know, having the, um, uh, the the liberal idea that the individual should be cared for, the dignity of, of the individual should be uh, held in high esteem, that needs attention. The idea that, man, in certain economic systems, you have disparities, and what can we do to help with that? That, that needs that needs attention. Um, but another thing the Christian can do, I think, is to um, recognize, not buy into ideologies being the end all be all, because these are all really recent. You know, all the ones <laughs> yeah. we've talked about, with the exception yeah. of nationalism, that's been around forever. Sure. But all the other ones, and I says, I bet, I guess, conservatism to some degree could exist wherever. But all the other ones are brand new or yeah. historically speaking right. and so these are not these did not come down from sinai <laughs> <laughs> right and so um not falling into that trap and recognizing that the individual will is not sovereign the good of the collective is not sovereign the status quo is not sovereign you know, looking back to a utopia that didn't exist is not uh, how man is redeemed you know but god is sovereign yeah. And in his sovereignty, he had a redemption that um, uh, was is perfect, and that's the redemption we have in Christ, in Christ alone. And so, remembering that, not 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 uh, getting caught up in the religious fervor of ideologies that are speaking very loudly yes. in our modern day moment. Yeah, yeah, that's that's huge. I think that um, I was just reading this in the Gospels the other day. Um, where Jesus is, is uh, all of the discourse, he's talking through these different things, and he says, um, he says, everything, heaven and earth will pass away, but my yeah. words will never pass away. All of these ideologies will eventually pass away, right? Each ideology has some, some form of creed, some, some mm -hmm. you know, document or a set of beliefs and orthodoxy of some kind, um, but there is no constitution that will last forever, mm -hmm. right? The, the constitution are not the words that will never pass away, yeah. as good as it is to promote flourishing. Um, you know, the socialist manifesto is not that that's going to pass away. Yeah, and so yeah. none of these things will exist and continue to exist forever. Yeah. Um, only God's words, only, only that. That's the only creed that will endure forever. I saw a quote recently uh, from John Piper, and he said, he said, soon, he said, America and all of its presidents will be simply a footnote, hmm. but the kingdom of God will last forever. Amen. Yeah. So. Yeah. So... You know, and so you know, for the the Christian to 
do some kingdom business in their hearts because um, these ideologies speak loudly and um, it's everywhere. And so it's, and it's not that we want to just remove ourselves from the political sphere because these, of these ideologies. We can transcend those ideologies and be a force of good in our society as we allow his kingdom to come through us and remembering that our allegiance is to the one true king, not whatever ideology fits our flavor. Sure. Good. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for putting in the, the work of yeah. reading that pretty meaty and intense book. Um, but, yeah, it's a great but book. It's a, it's a blessing. And thank you for tuning in, and uh, we're excited to see you next time.